All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. It's a little bit after 12. So welcome members and guests to our League of Women Voters um, public forum. This one is hosted by our newly formed Environment and Natural Resources group. Um, I'm Robin Jordan, chair of the League of Women Voters of Charlevoix and Emmett County. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization we encourage informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. If you have any interest in joining the League, um, you may visit our website. If as any members have an interest in joining our new Environment and Natural Resources group, you can put your name in the chat. You can uh, talk to Ann Scott, Nancy, or Marsha Meyer. A little bit of etiquette. We're gonna stay muted throughout the session to keep background noise at a minimum. We are gonna have a question and answer period at the end. And because we have a limited number of participants, um, you know, either put it in the chat, which is ideal because we have someone monitoring that, or you go ahead and raise your hand and you'll be unmuted, you could ask your question. Uh, the presentation will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel um, when it's done in a few days. So I'm gonna turn this over now to the co-chair of our Environment and Natural Resources Committee, Ann Scott. Ann, you need to unmute. There. there you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm here to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Del Bono, and we she goes by Lisa. So she is the state liaison coordinator for Citizens Climate Lobby, which I'll refer to as CCL, and she may refer to as CCL a little bit later. CCL's um, she co-leads CCL's national health action team. And she's the founder and executive director of the Michigan Clinicians for Climate Action. That's a coalition of health professionals focused on addressing and preventing the adverse effects of climate change. Um, prior to all of this, well, not really prior because she's been active in CCL for, um, geez, since 2012. Lisa practiced as a diagnostic pathologist for more than 30 years. But she became passionate about addressing climate change when it became clear to her that the crisis would unfold during her son's lifetime. This climate crisis is a public health crisis, not unlike the pandemic, and the extent to which it affects future generations will be defined by how quickly we reduce emissions. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa today as our speaker. Please welcome her. <laughs> Thank you very much, you guys. Um, I'm gonna be also trying to make sure that uh, there aren't people in the waiting room. So I don't know if that's something other people can see, probably not. Um, I hope nobody comes late to this because I think once I share my PowerPoint, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to see that. That's the only problem that I can figure out. Let me see if there's a way that I can get that. I don't see how I can share my PowerPoint and see that at the same time. Um, so I guess if somebody's late at this point, we're just gonna have to be late. Um, can everybody see this? Anne, can you speak up or Robin uh, to let me know if you can speak, see this? Can you say out loud if you see it? No, I don't see anything yet. Oh, okay. Sorry, let me do it again. Sorry. Yep. There we go. Oh, and you guys do stay there. Okay, that's good. I think when I share from, yeah, okay. Hopefully I'll see if somebody joins. And if anybody has questions, we're a relatively small group. And if anybody has questions as we go through this, please feel free um, to unmute and ask a question, um, or we can take them at the end either way. I wanted to start out by uh, with this picture of my mom, 
who was probably younger at the time than I am now. And that's me in the background. I was about 16 then. And it was right before I went away to college. And she, um, she told me that when I got the time, I should really check out the League of Women Voters because the League of Women Voters was just such an empowering organization, she felt. And this was years and years and years ago. So I want to thank you for inviting me here. And I want to thank you for your work. I think it's inc incredibly important work. And thanks to Anne, especially for inviting me. So as Anne indicated, um, you know, how does somebody who has literally spent decades um, looking through a microscope and diagnosing disease end up being a climate advocate? And I think first and foremost, it came from the point of view of a parent. It became clear to me that his future probably was going to be, you know, dramatically impacted by the climate crisis and that um, it was unfolding now. And what we did now was going to detract, directly determine his future, probably as much as what college he got into or any of the things that we are all so incredibly invested in. I had thought that, you know, climate change was something that I was concerned about, but it was something that, you know, somebody would figure out. And, um, you know, if it hadn't been figured out by the time I retired, well, maybe I'd volunteer for that. But it was unfolding way too quickly. And I, I had a dream, which I'm sure is not unlike your dream, that our children, our grandchildren would have the privilege of experiencing, you know, beautiful falls in, in our area and our pristine landscapes to hike and bike and swim, kayak and camp. And that, you know, they would be able to go to farmer's markets in the same way that we went to farmer's markets and they would, we would have the plentiful choices that we do today. And that possibly even they would be able to make snow caves and ski regularly, but already we're starting to see seasons in which snow is not reliably there. The ski teams will tell you that a lot of times they have to really invent and create ways to continue to compete. And this is likely to change and get worse going forward. And in fact, if we continue to burn fossil fuels as we are right now, by the end of the century, Detroit will be more like Cedar Hill, Texas. So that is a drastic difference. And it's what we do now to reduce emissions that will determine whether that is reality or we can stop it. We have that choice right now. We can do that. We wait too long, then we don't have the choice anymore. It's likely that if we continue to um, depend on fossil fuels as we are right now, we will lose all our maples, our, all our beaches, all our birches. Um, and it would, the, those, that forest will be replaced by trees that can handle warmer temperatures. Um, this is what our um, sweet tangos and um, honey crisps look like a few years back. Um, they were just, our, our fruits and our vegetables are becoming harder to grow because the seasons are less and less predictable. This was after a big hailstorm, and uh, the fruit just didn't handle it well. Our grape vines, which have become so plentiful, at least in my area, and I think in Petoskey as well, um, are becoming more and more difficult to grow. A few years back because of the extreme cold, which paradoxically is related to the melting of the polar ice cap, um, the extreme cold damaged the fruits and their ability to harvest it went down by about 50%. And, I, and they had to actually replace some of the grape vines that had been well, well established. Uh, a friend of mine had um, planted a uh, uh, area of her uh, acreage with um, with grapevines, thinking that it would it would be an investment in her children's future, and it's never uh, panned out because um, it's that much harder to grow uh, grapes. And she's a pretty proficient gardener. And of course, we have the privilege of living on 18% of the global. Uh, fresh water supply in the world. And it's incredibly precious because I'm sure as you know, water has become, has the potential to become significantly more scarce throughout the world. Um, and our water is changing. If you look at how frequently um, 
the ice coverage over the Great Lakes occurs, it's decreasing. Uh, it's decreased by about 25%. And I, I think you don't need a graph to know that. I think anybody who pays attention knows that. And anybody who's paid attention knows that our water levels are really unusually high. Uh, this is fish town. And people, you know, our infrastructure, I've uh, areas, we've had many, many roads out here that have had to have maintenance done on them because of the uh, encroachment of the water. Now, water won't necessarily stay high. They say that uh, the Great Lakes levels will actually uh, fluctuate significantly. So we'll see extreme highs and extreme lows and it'll go much more quickly. That's the prediction at this point. And the quality of our water, especially in more shallow Great Lakes like the Lake Erie is becoming less good. This was back in 2014 after a toxic algae bloom. Now tox toxic algae blooms have always occurred, but they occur much more frequently now because the temperature of the water is greater and we use all these fertilizers to grow our foods and they run off into our lakes and that's the perfect, you know, um, composite to create uh, these toxic algae blooms. People couldn't drink or bathe in the water for about three days in 2014 there. And then we get more extreme weather events. I don't know if you, if Petoskey was affected quite as badly as Traverse City and, and Leland on August 4th, 2015, but this is a really, really memorable storm. Uh, 100 mile an hour winds. Um, I was home alone and trees came down and it was really, really intense. In Houghton over Father's Day um, in 2018, they had the third once in a thousand year flood to hit the south shores of uh, Lake Superior in less than a decade. So once in a thousand year flood happening three times in a decade. Things are changing. It literally buckled the roads as you can see from this photograph. And then when we have these extreme weather events, what happens unfortunately, and this is a health impact, is that our sewer systems can't handle it. And um, the flood waters, the, the storm waters combine with our uh, sewer waters and we get contaminations of our streams and our lakes. And I'm sure you guys are probably have the same thing where after a bad storm, our bay, the Traverse Bay is often closed to swimming for a day or two because of E. coli uh, con concentration being high. Now the health impacts of climate change, which I've really uh, focus on more and more um, in our area. I'm going to just go over a few of them. How many here, raise your hands, have noticed um, allergy seasons are just like, well, now, I mean, people in Michigan always have had problems with allergy seasons, but throughout the Northern Hemisphere, the length of the seasons has gotten significantly uh, longer and the concentrations of the pollens is actually greater. Similarly, our lengths of our flea and tick, our mosquito and tick seasons are greater, and they have the potential to contain, to carry infectious diseases. And those infectious agents are actually the number of them within the host, within the tick or the uh, mosquito is greater. Um, poison ivy is becoming more virulent and then maybe not so much in our area. In our area, we have really good air quality for the most part, except for like around Cherry Festival. Um, but in urban areas like Detroit and Flint, where there's a lot more refineries and traffic, asthma has really reached an epidemic proportion. Now, when we think about climate change, we think about it typically as the polar bear issue. But human health is actually the human face of climate change, if you will. Now the Lancet is a really popular British journal, medical journal, very well respected. And they actually say climate change is the greatest public health threat of the 21st century. And that's a pretty powerful statement to make in the middle of a pandemic, right? But actually, you know, this is an existential threat. So it is a greater threat. Um, and there's much that we can learn from the pandemic that can be applied uh, to climate change. Now it's not all gloom and doom though, because um, the Lancet also describes it as the greatest public health opportunity. Now, why would I say health opportunity? Why would that be the case? Well, it's because much of what we do to address climate change is actually good for our health. Whether we're talking about more active transportation, walking or biking to work or play and creating the streets and infrastructure in our cities to make that easy and safe, 
or eating less meat or driving maybe hybrid or electric vehicles or not idling our car. All of those things reduce emissions, but they're also good for our health. And what we need to do is put policies in place so that the easy and safe choice is the healthy choice and the environmentally friendly choice. And of course, transitioning to clean forms of energy away from fossil fuels is another potent thing, probably the most potent thing to reduce emissions. And fossil fuel pollution is bad for our health even if you don't take climate change into account. It's really a form of secondhand smoke, not unlike breathing in uh, cigarette smoke. And as I mentioned, in urban areas, asthma has reached epidemic proportions. Now, there are many, many triggers to asthma, many which we're familiar with, like um, I showed you the picture of the ragweed, but pollen and cats and cigarette smoke, but it's also traffic and it's also refineries and, and fossil fuel based industry that creates air pollution and air pollution gets worse when things are warmer. Um, and it's interesting though, because you know we think about climate change and we think about the greenhouse gases which are warming the environment. And we say, oh, that's such a concern because they, they stay around for a long, long time and that's true. But air pollutants, at, in, in contrast, fall out of the atmosphere actually within minutes. So we can get realize health benefits right away from transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, in LA, back in July of 2011, they, there was a 10 mile stretch of the 405, this multi-lane highway was closed for 36 hours for repair. And air quality improved and they were measuring this within minutes, within minutes for a hundred mile radius. And there were actually a decreased number of VR visits. Similarly in Atlanta, when parts of the um, highways were closed due to the Olympics, uh, ER visits due to asthma went down. And that's been shown in a lot of different cities. So air pollution is really deadly. And I think that this is something that people just don't recognize. We think about asthma and asthma is horrible and, and a big deal, but actually, um, it's estimated that 10 to 15% of all deaths in the contiguous US have air pollution as a factor, as a comorbidity. Um, and if you look at particulate air pollution, fine particles in the air that's causing air pollution, there's a correlate between how great the concentration of that is and actually cognitive or um, uh, uh, mental difficulties as we get older. So if you live in an area with hot air pollution is greater, you're more likely to have dementia. Similarly, there's an increased incidence of preterm deliveries, low birth weights and stillbirths in the US. There was um, a CBS report just recently, or might've been ABC, where a pe pediatrician got on and she was talking about the fires and, and California and how all these women kept coming in to her practice, uh, delivering babies um, early uh, as, as the particulate matter got greater because of wildfires. But particulate matter is also part of just what is seen in inner city Detroit. And then um, since COVID has come, they actually found that just a very, very small amount of that partic particulate matter, if it's in greater concentration, leads to a much higher uh, morbidity rate. So what that means is you're much more likely to die from COVID if you're in an area where air pollution is higher. And we know that people of color are dying at a much higher rate than white people are from COVID. And it's there are many reasons, but one of them is air pollution. So when you start thinking about the racial, racial disparities that we, that have come you know, to the light this year, and you think about that phrase, I can't breathe, you realize I can't breathe means much, much more than the horrific things that we've seen on TV, which are horrific related to the police violence, but also this is something that has occurred. The quality of our lives living this beautiful fossil fuel-based um, uh, 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 existence is paid in part by people who are suffering, who are breathing in air pollution and have been and dying from it for decades. 
Now, this might be a little bit of a complicated uh, map, but I think it really brings home a point. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with redlining, but it was a situation back in the 1930s where they would grade different neighborhoods and low income and minority communities were intentionally cut off from lending and investments in their communities. So they have looked at the different studies and there's a whole bunch of them that the red lines here, these are maps of three cities in, in California and the red areas were the um, considered the worst area, the red lined areas, yellow was second worst, then, uh, then blue, then green. So blue and green are desirable areas, yellow and red less desirable areas. And this was back in the 1930s that this was happening. But what they found is that even now, if you look at ER visits due to asthma, they parallel the red line area. So here's the red line areas in this city. Here are, the, here are the areas where ER visits are the highest, the dark purple, red line areas, red line areas. And there's a real correlation there. And it's largely because these areas are the areas where the traffic concentration, this is where the interstates go through, this is where the fossil fuel and, and heavy manufacturing is located. And these people are suffering worse um, asthma or uh, consequences of air pollution. And then if we look at heat, while heat kills, we know that we're having more and more extreme heat events. And there are many vulnerable groups. Uh, newborn babies are one, our young athletes are one, but there's also people living in urban areas, especially elderly people who don't have access to air conditioning. So if you look again at these historically redlined communities, now this is Richmond, Virginia, and you look at the red, red line areas again, least des desirable yellow next least and then blue is B and green is desirable. And you look at these areas and this is the temperature difference with purple being the coolest and that's kind of on the outskirts and yellow being the hottest and it's many degrees higher in the inner city areas. And that's because these outer areas, again, these green and blue areas, the desirable areas, have a lot more green infrastructure, have a lot more trees and just greening of their communities. This is all concrete and it holds the heat. And these people can't escape the heat and they die at an increased frequency. So again, racial disparities. So take home message here, we address climate change, human health benefits. We can avoid, if we can keep climate change under two degrees C, According to Drew Schindel, who testified to Congress in August, we can avoid 4.5 million premature deaths in the US, 3. million hospitalizations and ER visits, 300 million lost workdays, and $700 billion a year in benefits from improved health and labor. So um, when you think about the money required to <laughs> invest and transition to clean forms of energy and um, address a climate change. When you factor in health co-benefits, it's really a no-brainer. So fortunately, many of us, and I would guess almost everybody here is are doing things, I'm just gonna check the time, are doing things to try to uh, you know, address climate change. And that's, and that's terrific, that's important. But what we also need to do is coordinated collective action. And this is where the League of Women Voters is so on top of things. This is your expertise, right? Um, trying to be responsible citizens, encouraging other people to do that and engaging with our policymakers. So what is an important uh, climate policy? Well, I would say, first of all, let's, it should improve health. It should uh, reduce emissions so that we stay under that two degrees and ideally under 1.5. It cleans up the air because we now know that that's really important to human health, right? It protects those vulnerable communities while at the same time reducing emissions. We'd like it to be easy to implement because we're running out of time. And we want it to transparent so that we know what's happening. Everybody can see what happen, is happening and know that it's, a fair, it's fair. And then finally, it should be bipartisan legislation as opposed to executive action. If we take a second and we think about the Affordable Care Act and other executive actions that have, been, that have occurred over the years, it's very clear that that's a ping pong game, right? And 
it's not that we're against it, those things, but it's simply that they don't have the longevity of a bill that's passed and ideally a bill that's passed in a bipartisan way. So what I'd like to do now, and Anne is gonna drop in the, um, in the chat a link. Um, and if you want to go to that area on your computer at the same time, you're welcome to, or you could do it later. But I'm gonna look at this global climate uh, simulator that it's looking at different solutions and it's put together by MIT. And um, it, they basically use a bunch of scientific data. And I can show you graphs if you're interested afterwards that, that show there's a lot of reasons to feel that this is a credible source. But let's just take a look at a few different solutions. And what I realize is that I'm not, I need to get that out of there. I can't see my, um, my top this way. Oh, well, we'll see um, if we can figure it out. Lisa, Pardon me? Yeah, I can't, I can't seem to get out of my zoom to get to drop that. I can't seem to figure out how to do it. The zoom is taking up my whole thing unless I. Okay. Um, and I, I can put that in the chat. Can you? Have the same you. document. So I'll work on it. Thank that. you. Okay, I perfect. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay. So basically, this is what, if you were to go into this, this is what it would look like on the, web, on the website. And I'm going to go over here and I need to get, and I just want to, sorry, here we go. Let's go back. I put you guys on the bottom of my screen so I could see things better. So anyhow, this is business as usual. And you'll see there's a graph and it's kind of complicated, but over here are your different energy sources. And this is what they project will happen kind of middle of the road likelihood. And this, by the end of the century, they think kind of middle of the road, 3.6 degrees. Some people say it'll go up to 4.3, but you know, there's a variety of range. There's a range there. So we'll say middle of the road, 3.6 is kind of business as usual. And then there's a whole bunch of other things that you could do, like you could phase out coal and it would change you know, um, the emissions reductions. And so we'll see it comes down and, and we're just gonna take a look at it, some of those. So the first one that we're gonna look at is, well, what if we planted a whole bunch of trees? A lot of the Republicans have talked about the A Million Tree Initiative. And I'll tell you, I love trees and we've planted a ton of them. And I think it's a really good thing to do. But if you look at what happens when you plant, plant a bunch of trees, the average temperature goes down by about uh, 0.1 degree. So that's not gonna get us where we need to go. Okay, so let's go back to business as usual and try a different lever. And this time we're going to um, improve energy efficiency. And what that means when you improve energy efficiency, if anybody's doing this in parallel, you can hit these three dots and I'll tell you what, what, what they're talking about, but what they're talking about is improving public transportation, uh, hybrid vehicles, um, encouraging people to walk and that sort of thing. Well, we can go from 3.6 to 3.4 degrees. That's an improvement, but it's not enough. Okay, let's go back to ba baseline. I'll put all our levers back to normal. And let's look at something else. What if we electrify the transportation system? What that means is we have electric buses, electric trains, certainly an important thing to do, but again, we're just going from 3.6 to 3.5 degrees. Not enough. Okay, let's go back to baseline. All our levelers are back to normal. Let's try phasing out coal. Okay, so we've taken our coal and we've moved it all the way to the left. It's high highly regulated or taxed, and we phased it all out and we've gone from 3.6 to 3.4 degrees. Not enough. Okay, so let's do, let's phase out coal. We move that all the way over. Let's phase out oil. Let's phase out natural gas and let's heavily increase in renewables. Okay, now we're making some progress. Now we can decrease it to 3.0 degrees, but that's still not enough. What else do we need to do? Okay, what if we, electrify our transportation system and our buildings and we improve energy efficiency. Okay, now we're getting down to the range that we need, 2.5 degrees. That's getting much, much closer. Okay, let's go back again to this baseline, okay? All our levers are back to the same. Now let's look at what happens if you put a steadily increasing fee or a carbon price on it 
like the one that CCL proposes. Oh, that alone will get you to 2.4 degrees. That alone, without all the other things. Now, what the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividends Act, again, that's some, you'll see all the other levers are normal. What if we, it actually has a contingency that we would uh, tax um, F gases, that's gases that contain fluorides that are used in refrigerants and that sort of thing. Those are way more potent greenhouse gases. So we're gonna add that into the, the bill, which is actually already there. Now we're down to 2.3 degrees, okay? So the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividends Act essentially, or a carbon pricing system that's similar to that would, um, would essentially do what all well, what it does is it creates an incentive to phase out coal, phase out renewables, phase out oil, et cetera. That's why we get the temperature de decrease that is so profound. Now, what if you do that and then uh, you have maybe another bill in place, like there's one's called the Growing Climate Solutions Act, Act, which actually is looking at regenerative ag and supporting regenerative ag. So what if we, we actually change our ag processes eat less meat um, and farm in a way that isn't so heavy with fertilizers and um, replenishes the soil and sequesters carbon. Okay, now we're down to two degrees. So we're getting in the ballpark there. And then let's say we also electrify and improve energy efficiency. We're down to 1.6 degrees. And um, let's say we green things as well. We, we uh, plant some trees and are green, green our inner cities. So we're really close now at 1.6 degrees. And then we could actually add some kind of new technology in that captures carbon. Uh, that's a little bit debatable whether that will come up. But um, again, there, the carbon pricing solution that CCL supports actually has something in there that if they can demonstrate that carbon is sequestered or captured, they would get paid to, to, to do that. So you can get down to 1.5 degrees. And that's where they say that we need to go in order to reduce the worst emissions for um, our children. So we can get there, but it's gonna take a variety of initiatives and the strongest lever is a price on emissions. Any questions about that? There was a question in the chat, Lisa, that I thought was relate, kind of related to that. It says, after COVID, more people will be working from home. Is anyone measuring that impact? Yeah, I think there have been studies. Um, I can't quote them here, but I think clearly there have been studies that have looked at how air pollution has increased, I mean, has reduced, has gotten better. Um, the air has gotten cleaner uh, since people have stayed home. So um, I think that certainly decreasing our, our transportation will improve air quality and reduce emissions. I can't quote exactly uh, the studies, but I know that I've seen them and that that has clearly happened, actually fairly significantly, I think. Okay, so what we learned, I hope, from doing that exercise, and now it's a really quick exercise through En-ROADS. They actually have systems that you could do them over three hours. So that was a pretty quick overview. <laughs> um, but I hope what we learned is that, you know, burning fossil fuels is bad for our health, even if you don't take climate into climate change into account, air pollution is just bad for us. And that a price on emissions would actually catalyze that transition from dirty fossil fuels to clean forms of energy. And, um, you know, just to see who, who's, who thinks this is good. Well, um, in 2000, um, I can't remember, 20, 2018, I think this was published, maybe 2019, um, over 3,500 US economists from both sides of the aisle, including all the uh, former federal uh, chairs of the Federal Reserve, 27 Nobel laureates, 15 former chairs of the Council of Economic Advisories, and two former secretary of treasurers, they all agreed that a steadily increasing tax or fee is the most effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at the scale, scale and speed necessary. That's essentially what the En-ROADS shows. 
So we know that economists agree. That includes Janet Yellen, by the way. She's a supporter of carbon pricing, our new uh, Secretary of Treasury, but also major businesses, including uh, 21 Fortune 500 car uh, companies, the Business Roundtable, which are CEOs of businesses that have a net worth of $7 trillion, and the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, people like Gina McCarthy, who um, was the former head of the EPA, who bet, Pete bet Buttigieg, and um, Obama. So um, I guess one question I have for the group is, you know, if we put a tax or fee on there and it does reduce emissions, what do people think we should do with, and I'm just checking our time so I don't go over. Um, what do you think people think we should do with, with all that money that's generated? And that money that the quantity of money that's generated is um, kind of is on the line of the stimulus checks that we've seen. Can you guys read anything out in the chat if there's if people are making suggestions or do yes. people want to unmute? Yes, I've got a couple here. Um, there's a couple really good questions. If um, I continue to burn fossil fuels and have to pay a tax, to whom is the tax paid and do those funds contribute to better climate policies? So I think you need to clarify this tax or price on carbon a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. And then another one is, can you explain how such a tax would be implemented in real life? Would this be industry and individual citizens? So I think it's getting at the same thing there a little okay, bit. Okay, those are great, great questions. So the way that um, the ideal uh, carbon tax or fee would actually be implemented as far upstream as possible. So it's actually a tax not on individuals, like not on you and me, but it's on fossil fuel companies. It's basically saying, if you're gonna take your pollutants, which is what greenhouse gases are, and dump them in our atmosphere and cause these major impacts, you have to pay a fee equivalent to what, uh, to the greenhouse gases that they produced. And it's actually fairly simply uh, implemented the Department of Energy by doing it as far upstream as possible, um, you have very few number places that you have to actually institute uh, the fee. Um, a lot of these numbers are already known. The implementation and the administrative cost is relatively low and it would be taken directly out of the funds that are generated. So now what we do know though, is that fossil fuel companies um, will pass at least a portion of that fee down to the consumer. And so that's what gets to this other question. Let me go back one more thing. Because it's done as far upstream as possible, it's really different than a gasoline tax. It's gonna affect absolutely everything. Because it's as far upstream as possible, any items that are being produced or manufactured in our whole system will see a higher cost if they are using fossil fuels to produce that, that, um, that product. So let's say you're in the shirt making business and I'm not, obviously I'm not a, I don't sell things and so I'm not a business person, but if you're running your company, um, your, your whole production using fossil fuel based ener energy rather than switching over to solar panels and, you know, heating with maybe a heat pump or other things, all of those costs will go up and they'll pass that down to the consumer. You can make a bitter, bigger product. It's gonna to happen to all, all businesses. So if you want, if that business wants to compete better on the market, what they're gonna do is they're gonna power their, their business using clean forms of energy. They basically know, okay, the price on fossil fuels is going to go up. And the way this is designed is it starts low at about $15 per ton. So it doesn't shock the system. And every year it goes up in a very, very predictable way. And so everybody knows it's gonna change. And then it gives them time to change their business plan so that they can power on clean forms of energy. It also creates an incentive to innovate. Okay, well, I don't know how to produce this product quite that way. 
Well, it gives them reason to figure out how to do that. And once that incentive to, towards innovation is there, um, there, there's no question that they will respond to that. So that's how that works. Now, what about the people, the average person? Yeah, Anne. Um, well, there's another question um, about this person would like to see the money go to improving our recycling system and promote use of recycled material. So you might want to explain where the money goes. That's, that's what this question is generated. What should happen to all the money that's generated by the fee? And that's, that's, that's the question. And so the question, the answer, I think, and the way that at least the bill that we support um, uh, is designed is that you take that, that money minus the administrative costs that it, it takes to do this stuff and take all of it and return it back to American households. And what they know is that because everything's gonna increase in fee uh, in cost, it will hit the, the most economically challenged the hardest. That's what you would call a regressive tax, unless you give them the money back. So I'm gonna explain this in a little bit more detail. So we know that the cost of anything that depends on fossil fuels, lighting our house, putting gas in our car, that sort of thing are gonna go up. And it's estimated for every $10 per ton of the fee, it would go up by 10 cents at the pump. So that's not a huge amount and most of us can absorb that. And those, but those who make little money spend a larger percentage of the money they make on energy. So it is gonna hurt people who don't make a lot of money more. So we need to protect them during the transition. And what we know is this, is we know about a third of every individual person's carbon footprint comes from heating our home and turning our lights and driving our car. But two thirds comes from the things that we buy. Two thirds comes from the things that we buy. So the wealthy have a larger footprint in part because they're much bigger consumers, but also because they live in bigger houses and that sort of thing and drive more cars. So the more wealthy you are, typically the higher your carbon footprint is. But with carbon fee and dividend, everyone gets an equal piece of the revenue pie. So the smaller one's carbon footprint, and that's typically people who make less money, the further the dividend goes. And then if we consciously say, okay, those of us who make more money, I wanna use solar panels, I wanna walk and bicycle and that sort of thing, that money will go further for us as well. So if we take a look at this, this is quintiles based on earning, they're earning quintiles. So these are the people who make the least amount of money. These are the people who make the most amount of money. The dark blue is the amount of that income that's spent uh, heating our homes. Those are the direct costs, heating our homes and driving our cars. This light blue is the indirect, which is you know the things that we buy. And not surprisingly, people who are wealthy tend to buy a whole lot more than people who are not wealthy. And then this pink amount is investments, the amount of money people have in fossil fuel companies, because that will actually come, go down. And this is the dividend, the amount of money that goes back to um, each of the households. And it's the dividend after taxes. So people who are wealthy pay higher taxes on the dividend than people who are not wealthy. So people in the lowest quintile, almost all of them will have more money then the cost will increase. And it, that steadily becomes more even or actually goes down depending upon what income qual quintile you have. But for people who, for most low and middle income families, they'll have more money in their pocket. And people who don't typically have money in their pocket, getting money in the pot, their pocket stimulates the economy. Now, if we look at, um, it, in an overall picture, it's about 61% who would actually benefit from, would actually have more money in their pocket. 24% would have a minor loss, 0.2% of their income, and the rest would have a more significant loss. And if you're looking at the lowest quintile, these people who, who are, don't follow in, they think are mostly college students, so they don't make a lot of money, but they spend like they do. And then um, it goes down 
accordingly. So people who are in the very, very highest will take a little bit of a hit, but a hit that they probably won't notice very much anyhow. If we look at it according to race, again, this is overall, and you can see that people of color uh, tend to do a little bit better than white people, but that parallels income brackets. So again, those same economists say to maximize the, the fairness of all revenue should be returned directly back to US citizens. The majority of families, including the most vulnerable, would uh, come out ahead. Now in as, answer to that question, Anne, that what about investing in renewables? You know, um, some people, there are other bills that are in play that are also pretty interesting and I think neat in some ways to consider. And one of them, it's called the Climate Action Rebate Act, is kind of based on the one CCL has, but it's not bipartisan. Republicans haven't bought into it yet. And what they do is they take that big revenue pie, they take the bottom 70%, and return it in the way I just described, but they return it only to people who make, if you're a single making less than 100,000, if you're a couple making less than 150,000. So it's going for, to those people who are low income. Then they take that leftover pie and they uh, invest it in things like infrastructure, renewables, increasing resilience, preparing for climate change. So there are different ways that you can do this but doing dividend report return as part of it is really key. Okay, any other questions about this at this point? Because we're, we're at 1249, I wanna be respectful of time and I wanna give you a couple climate actions. Can I, can I run ahead to some climate actions real quickly? Sure, you could. And I'll say um, a couple comments that came through. So the tax creates incentive to use clean energy um, kind of a gentle nudge. Right. Like and what you were describing with the transition and the increase. That's exactly right. And it's then, a gentle nudge. It's a predictable nudge. It's transparent. So businesses actually really like this because they know what's coming. And it basically, it tells them, okay, something's going to happen. I need to make a change right now. You know what I mean? And they know how much of a change they need to do at a specific time. So they know it's gonna go up by $10 per ton every year. They can prepare for that. Um, another comment is I'd like to see, and you've addressed this somewhat, I'd like to see relief for people in urban areas to deal with hotter summers, air conditioning. I saw a podcast called Crooked about people dying from extreme heat in inner cities, which you've pointed out, so. Yeah. And it is true, people in inner cities are. And I do think that one of the ways to do this would be rather than the dividends going to everybody, it could go, go in a more directed way to uh, lower people of lower income and then take some of the leftover money to invest in ways um, that you know, may benefit people who have suffered the most in the ways that you described and, and prepare for things like heat and, and um, um, air pollution and a variety of other things. I mean, if we could increase our, or change um, in inner cities, when you look at the way the seats, the, the cities and the streets are set up, it is so hard for people not all of them, but many cities are designed in such a way that it's really hard to walk some of those really inner city areas because that they're, you know, there are highways coursing through things. So you might see something that looks like it's right across the street, but it's across a divided, you know, four lane in each direction highway. And you're kind of taking your life in your own hands to get across that. So if we could design our, our streets and our cities such that uh, they're walkable and bikeable for all people and there's green space for all people, that would certainly be beneficial. Whether that's all answered in a carbon price by itself or, um, and I guess I didn't show that part, maybe I'll go back to that. I would say that a price in carbon is essential. It amplifies and um, uh, stimulates many of the other things that need to be done, but it certainly is not enough by itself. You need some um, complementary uh, policies like the ones we're talking about. We need some regulations, especially some on local pollutants. 
And what's really cool when you're looking at carbon pricing, a carbon fee is much more easily administered along with complementary regulations as compared to a cap and trade system. Both of those will reduce emissions, but cap and trades are much more complicated in that they have secondary markets and offsets and people can kind of play, um, uh, uh, oh, what's the shell game? Whack-a-mole without really being able, it's not as transparent. And the fee is really transparent and works really nicely with complementary things. So it doesn't solve all the problems, but it is an important component of the solution. And You might wanna mention the bill that you've made reference to, cause I don't think you actually did. I haven't done that yet. No. So CCL um, supports a bill called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividends Act. And I will show you some of some of the information and taking action right now, where you can learn more about that. Um, and that is the um, one of four bipartisan bills that were in Congress last time, but it's the only carbon fee and dividend one, and it by far had more co-sponsors, almost all of them Dems, unfortunately. So we really need one of the calls to action. I would suggest is if you're interested in this. We need people on both sides of the aisle and we need people on the extremes of both sides of the aisle coming into the fold. Um, I, we feel really comfortable that we're in the middle because we have people on the extremes of both sides kind of doubting us. So it kind of suggests that our point of view really is in the middle. Um, but at this point, conservatives, um, our, our policy makers, our Republican policy makers, I think are still fearful to come out publicly in support of this. Privately, when we meet with them, many of them do support it, but they are fearful to come out because they're frightened of being primaried. So we need to encourage the public on both sides to support these initiatives in order for them to feel confident that they could, they could go forward on this. On this. And so these are some of the ways that we can do that. And that's what I wanted to show you guys next is what can, what can we do? Um, there was one other question. I don't know if I'm muted. Am I muted? No, no, I hear you. One other question. What are thoughts on deadlines for when this should be accomplished? That's a great question. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is essentially expert, uh, expert scientists on any area vaguely related to climate change um, from across the world, they have given estimates and they say we have 10 years, 10 years to reduce our emissions by 50% if we want to get under 1.5 degrees. So I'm really glad that question was asked because that brings home the point of why the carbon price is so important. It accelerates everything. It helps it get going. It really is that booster shot, if you will, uh, to get it moving. And I think that many, many people agree that if we don't have a price on carbon, we won't get there in time. To work to uh, to avoid the worst impacts of climate. Okay, so what can you do? I'm going to show you a couple things that you can do. I'm debating whether I should show. Um, I'll show them. There's. I'd also like to show you a video if we have enough time. Oh, I'm on the wrong spot. Let me go back. Sorry, I thought I got to the right spot. What can I do? Okay, we'll just start right here in the current slide. So there's a couple different things that you can do. And Robin, you have that sheet. Do you mind kind of putting that uh, in, the, in the chat? So I'm gonna go to this one first. You can join Citizens Climate Lobby. And so right here is, if you just go citizensclimatelobby.org, you, you can join Citizens Climate Lobby. And the next meeting that Anne is our chapter lead for the Petoskey chapter, it, this is still on, right, Anne? This Saturday at noon, and there's a Zoom line that you could join if you're interested. And I think Robin's gonna be putting that in the chat. I, that's on that sheet. Yep, good. So that's the first thing you can do. And Citizens Climate Lobby is 
there's so much you can learn from there. If I think it's a lot like the league, it gives you the opportunity to educate yourself in a whole, there's no way you can take advantage of all of them. And then here are two small actions that I would really encourage each of you to do. One of them is called the monthly call-in campaign and Robin's putting that in there right now. And I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna show you what that looks like real quickly. Um, I think if I can do it, let me see, Am I, did I stop my share? But I can't seem to get out of, there we go, I got it. Okay, what I wanted to show you here is what it looks like when with the monthly call-in campaign. So if you, let me get here, you have the joys of, the joys of um, internet, right? Okay. So if you join the monthly calling campaign at that, at that um, site, what you'll get is one time a month on a single day a month in your email, or you can get it on text. You'll get something that says, it's time to call your member of Congress about climate change. Please take five minutes and view the calling guide. So you hit this little view the calling guide and it basically will give you um, the name of the person and you'll get all three um, once you hit down here at the bottom when you say I called, then I'll take you to the next one. And there's the telephone number and the, they give you some talking points you can choose to, to use, but this is the key right here. I'm a constituent and I'm a voter and I'm calling to ask the Senator to take action on climate change and include carbon fee and dividend as part of the solution. You almost always will get an answering machine. And so it's really nothing to be intimidated about. And what this does is that it means that they get a call maybe two or three calls every day in their office from different constituents asking them to um, take action on climate change. And then there was one other thing I wanted to show you guys. And of course it's under here. So I have to, I have to get it. And then I know we're at the end of time. So we'll stop um, is I wanted to show you, I thought I had them up. Oh, oh I do. Um, right here, the other thing I'm showing you, because we used to do this thing called constituent comment forms where people, we would go to, um, we would go basically to farmer's markets and have people fill out little forms. And then we would take large numbers of these forms to our members of Congress. And we meet with them four times a year. Um, we would take them to our our meetings and actually Representative Bergman joined the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus when these high school students asked them to join. And prior to that, we had probably brought him 600 constituent comment forms. Well, we obviously can't do constituent comment forms now because um, we're not in person. So this is in lieu of it. And I just started this one, but it's an opportunity you can just you don't have to put a picture, but you can put a picture and, and you type in your name. And it's really, really easy. You just add to the board, you hit that add to the board and you can say, you know, um, please support, you know, whatever right here. And we ask that you do it in a very polite way. And you can actually add an image. You add an image, you can up upload it from your, from your, um, you know, choose a file like you always do and just add a picture and then it shows up uh, on that kudo board. And then we meet with them in March and we'll take that kudo board. And I, I hope that we have a few hundred of those or at least a hundred of them for Bergman and more than that for Stabenow to take to our meetings. And we literally meet with every member of Congress about four times a year. There might be one or two that we, you know, we don't, but um, for some reason, one month can't or something like that. But in general, that's that's what we do. Okay, we're out of time. I hope that kind of gave you a sense of what of what we do. I hope that was interesting. Um, Anna Lisa, Robin, thank you so much for this presentation. It was, uh, I think I'll speak for everybody that it was incredibly informative, very compelling argument, and really appreciate the innovative ways that. 
we can engage with our local government, which we are all about. And if you're familiar with the league, you know the league, uh, Michigan and US has multiple positions on uh, air quality, on carbon, right. So thank you for this, this was wonderful. This will be on our YouTube channel in a few days. Great. Thank if we you. were in person, you'd be hearing a lot of 